Hallelujah. You know, it's a blessing we can still congregate. It's a blessing. You know, um, Club Zion has been very fortunate. You know, we were one of the first churches to get back to assembling, and uh, we have been blessed that God has kept us safe. And um, we, we don't want to neglect being safe and careful. Um, I, I wear a mask, and I, I do that because I love you. That's, when you see me wearing a mask, then you know I love you. Um, it's the least I could do. As, as uncomfortable as it is. And um, anybody that has a beard knows that a mask is really uncomfortable. But I love you. I love you. That's why I do it. Um, you know, we're not out of the woods, guys. And I'm blessed that we have a vaccine coming. And you might say, well, God's in control. I'm not going to worry about that. God's in, God is in control. And, uh, and God's in control of all things. You know, I, I'm, I know that if I'm going to get hit by a semi-truck, I'm going to get hit by a semi-truck. But I'm not going to stand in the road <laughs> to uh, see how God's going to protect me. There's a, there's a degree of wisdom I'm going to use. and So I want to say that because... Uh, We've been good so far. Club Zion's been blessed, and we've been able to continue to congregate, hear God's word, lift up our voices in praise, and um, it's a blessing. It's a wonderful thing. Why are you here? Why are you here? Why did you get up this morning, get cleaned up, and put on your clothes and make it down here to Club Zion and get come into this building and sit down. Why are you here? What's the purpose? You ever think about what, what is your purpose for coming? Is it, I, uh, I'm going to go to church. Check. You know, I got that checked off this week. Um, is it because you want to hear God's word? Is it because you want to worship the Lord? Is it because you want to see God's people? Is it because you just want to check out what's going on at Club Zion? Or maybe it's all the above. There's a lot of things that I've experienced in my life. I've managed to make it to my ripe age of now collecting Social Security. And uh, I have experienced a lot of things. I've been, I've been adventurous. I've always been someone that was willing to try something once, at least. And um, through it all, I've learned that the book of Ecclesiastes is so true. It's so true. It, it speaks in the book of Ecclesiastes about how everything is, uh, is just thrown to the wind. You know, it's just everything is vanity, it, it talks about this world and this life and all that we put our trust in and all that we hang on to. And it talks about how it pales in comparison to what we have in Christ, what we have in the Lord, what, what the, heaven, the heavens are declaring and all that's in it. We, we uh, are so filled with adventure and I, I think that's wonderful. And I love adventure. I just totally love it. I love the adrenaline rush of adventure. It's wonderful. But it pales in comparison to the walk with Christ and the love of Christ, the comfort of Christ, the, the peace that he brings into your life. And there's people that go to church all their lives and never find that peace that God has for them in Christ Jesus. And when I was preparing the message today, I was thinking about a, a Pharisee called Nicodemus, a religious man, a highly intelligent man, a man that was a theologian, really. He, he knew the word of God. He was respected by his peers. Uh, 
but he was missing something in his life. There was something, something wasn't connecting. And as religious as he was and as de devoted as he was and as, as faithful as he was, he had something that was void. Something was not aligned in his life. And uh, he even had to sneak out in the night to secretly go to Jesus and talk to Jesus because maybe, possibly, could it be that maybe Jesus has something of which I'm missing? Could it be? And for many people that uh, walk into a church and start looking on the internet or picking up their Bible for the first time in 20 years, they find that they are much like Nicodemus. They, f they realize that the, the search for something greater has got to begin. I have to find out. There's got to be more than what the, the writer of Ecclesiastes said. There's got to be more than just blowing in the wind. There's got to be more than just what we see on the surface. Because what we see on the surface is, in reality, it's really fragmented, disjointed. It really is It's filled with dissension and confusion. The world is groping for answers. It's looking in every crevice and every cranny and it's pulling up every rock looking to be an answer. There's got to be a solution. The internet is filled with solutions. Filled. You can go online and find out everything you want to find out. You can find out where are the best places to go and worship rocks. Yeah, you can. You can find out where they have the best rocks to worship. I personally, honestly need something a little bigger than a rock, a little greater than a rock, and a little more comforting than a rock. I need the peace of God in my life. I need it. I need the peace of God. And when you think about the, that phrase, the peace of God, some people believe that God is this this furious ruler that sits in a throne with his white beard and he's ready with his lightning bolt to strike you down as soon as you mess up. But that's not God. He's the God of all comfort, it says. He's the God of peace. It says that he's the God who provides. The God who provides. Provides what? Everything. That's why he's called the great I am. He is what you need. Not that you dictate him. That's not that you rule over him. Not that you boss him around. But he knows your needs before you realize what your needs are. Do you realize that God has been here today for you? Before today ever existed? He was here. Matter of fact, God was in the year 2020 before the earth was created. It's not like he's caught off guard and doesn't know your needs. He knows them. And I think about Nicodemus was this religious man. I mean, a really, really religious man. And yet he was void of something that he was looking for. And he didn't even know what it was. But he thought, maybe this teacher that I've been hearing about, maybe this, this miracle man I've been hearing about, maybe, possibly, this Jesus, who I'm not even allowed to talk to, i got to sneak out at night to go ask him questions, maybe, maybe he knows something. Maybe he knows something. Maybe you're here today and you're distraught. Maybe you're weary. Maybe there's fear in your life. Maybe you have concerns that are so overwhelming you can't even sleep at night.
You're beyond and way past worrying about what you're going to wear tomorrow. Your cares go so much deeper. Your pain goes so much deeper. Some of you, it's a financial issue. Maybe some of you, it's a, it's a physical or a health issue. For some of you, your mind might be tormented. But you are here today to hear the word of God. And the Bible says that the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword able to divide your soul from your spirit. I'm going to say that again. The word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, meaning it cuts both ways, able to divide your soul from your spirit. I'm paraphrasing a little bit here, but that's the verse. Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. Your mind, your will, and your emotions. Those are the three things that always turn your world upside down. Your mind, your will, and your emotions always turn your world upside down. And the word of God is able to separate the spirit of the living God in you from the cares of the world. See, your mind, your will, and your emotions can sometimes be tormenting. Anybody got an amen to that? Can be tormenting. Your mind, your will, and your emotions. The Spirit of God is the Spirit of all comfort, the Spirit of all peace. It, it's not the Spirit of confusion, it's the Spirit of love and power. The Spirit of God is a sound mind. The Spirit of God is the side that we're all searching for. And the soul is the thing that always seems to get in the way. Have you ever had your soul ruin things for you? Your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions. Has it ever ruined anything? Has it ever gotten in the way of your relationships? Has it ever gotten in the way of uh, goals? Has anybody ever had an emotional situation? You ever have an emotional breakdown? You ever get too happy or too sad? Or you ever have both (laughs) in the same day? The Bible says that the carnal mind The carnal mind, the human mind, is at odds with God. It's not on the same page. And our emotions have no wisdom. Has no wisdom. It's geared by the outside experiences. Our emotions are affected by outside experiences, outside people. What happens to your kids when you tell them you're going to Disney World? You're taking them to Disney World. Emotions. What happens when you tell them they're closed? Emotions. Outside experiences. Outside people. But see, Nicodemus was looking for something that could supersede his outside experiences even though he was a religious man. You could be a very religious person and still have outside experiences constantly bombarding you and attacking you. It's called oppression. You're not possessed, you're oppressed. A Christian can never be possessed because the devil is not welcome to live in God's house. But you could be oppressed. I'm not going to have an evil person live in my house, but it won't stop an evil person from coming by and throwing eggs at my house. God is good. Now, pray with me. Heavenly Father, open, open your word in such a way 
that we fully, totally, completely understand it today. And help us, Lord God, to be moved by it, to be truly moved by it, Lord. Not just because it's a sermon or because we're in church. Or be, let it only be, Lord, your spirit moving our spirit just a little closer to you. Oh, Lord, I pray for any needs in this room, if they're physical, if they're spiritual, if they're financial, if it's health problems, if it's mental problems, if it's relational I pray, Father God, that you mend the broken hearts to help each person in this room move away from the whirlwind and move closer to the Prince of Peace. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus Christ. And thank you, Holy Spirit, as you anoint your word today. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. John chapter 3, verse 1 says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Nicodemus, a Pharisee a ruler of the Jews, comes to Jesus Christ and says, Rabbi, which means teacher, teacher, we know. So there's a, there's a group of rabbis that are talking to each other. Now they all, there's many of them and most of them that don't want to even know about Jesus and want to kill him, but there's a certain amount of Jews and this is early in the ministry. They're curious We know that you are a teacher come from God for no one can do these signs unless they're from God. So he recognizes that there's something in Jesus Christ that's different, unique. And you might be here today because you realize that there's something different about this Jesus Christ and something unique about this Jesus Christ. That's why you're here. You just know. Something inside of you knows that there's something different about this Jesus Christ. Now, we're reading about something that took place over 2,000 years ago. And yet, here we are over 2,000 years later still talking about it. So we know that there's something different about this Jesus, something unique about this Jesus. And that's why I'm here. I'm here because of this Jesus Christ. And some of you have been here for 20-something years because of this Jesus Christ. Some of you have been going to church for 50, 60 years because of this Jesus Christ who is different, unique. That's why you're here, just like Nicodemus. But Jesus responds to him after he says, hey, we know that you came from God. We know that you're a teacher. And we know that nobody does these signs unless they're from God. And Jesus answers him and said to him, most assuredly. Do you know what most assuredly means? You could stake your life on this. You could could stake your life on this. Most assuredly, Jesus says to him, I say to you, Nicodemus, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now for Nicodemus, this is something that he's not heard of yet. This is something he's not aware of yet. This is something he can't digest, born again. I remember growing up as a kid, the religion that I grew up in didn't didn't talk about born again. I never heard about born again until I was a teenager and someone brought up born again. And my first reaction was, that's weird. Born again? That's weird. And then I came to realize that that was a, that was a, um, a Protestant term. 
So therefore, it was not something I really had to believe in because it was a Protestant thing. And I never read the Bible, so I never knew this was in here. I never knew Jesus actually said that. So that was something that didn't apply to me, and I wasn't interested in it. And so, you know, get away from me, you Jesus freak. Basically, was my attitude. Jesus goes on and says, and Nicodemus said to Jesus, he says, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? I don't know if Nicodemus is being cute or absolutely stupid. But one or the other, he, he responds back to Jesus because he, he, he's hearing something that is weird. And I don't know about you, but sometimes when we hear something weird, we respond with a kind of a sarcasm, don't we? I know you do when you, when you hear something weird from me. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot, cannot. It didn't say he might be or maybe can be. He cannot, what? He cannot enter the kingdom of God. Just think about that. That means that every single person on the entire planet, according to Jesus Christ, cannot enter the kingdom of God unless, what? They're born again. Wow, that's a big problem for a lot of people, especially a lot of people that don't know what this means or understand what he's saying. There was a time when it was a problem for me because I didn't know or understand, and I wasn't willing to comprehend or even want to understand. It was foreign to me. Jesus goes on. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can these things be? Don't forget, Nicodemus is a scholar of the word of God, the Old Testament. He's a religious man. He's devoted his entire life to serving God, a religious man. He was stable in all his ways concerning the Jewish religion. And he says, how can these things be? Jesus answered Nicodemus and said, are you the teacher of Israel and you don't know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we, we, speak what we know and testify what we have seen and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can, I, how can you believe if I tell you spiritual things or heavenly things? No one has access to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven, and as Moses lift up, lifted, up, lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. As the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness and everyone who looked upon it lived, 
so is Jesus Christ who is lifted up on the cross and anyone who looks to him shall be saved, shall be made whole. Born of flesh and spirit, born of water and spirit. The first time you come into this world through your mom and you're brought into this world, her water breaks and there you are flesh and blood. You're human. You're human. Born of the flesh. But see, born of the flesh does not qualify you to dwell in heaven. Something needs to change. No flesh can stand before God. No flesh can enter heaven. No flesh. That's why when you die... You're put in a box and you're buried because that body cannot go to heaven in its condition. God has to change it. He has to change you. How does he change you? Well, he starts all over. You're spiritually birthed. That's what born again means. It means born from above. There, what takes place is you have a spiritual birth. You have a heavenly birth. And the heavenly birth comes when God quickens your spirit and makes it one with his. And you have a spiritual birth that takes place. And in that spiritual birth, it's not just that you're born again. It means that you are born again. A whole new life. There's a spiritual life now taking place. And that spiritual life that is now taking place The word of God is feeding your spirit. The Holy Spirit is organizing and and designing and developing and putting together all the pieces of your spiritual life. And it grows and it matures and it, it develops. And spiritually, something unique is happening to you. And you find that life begins to have purpose, meaning, peace, security, There comes with it this sense of wisdom that you never thought you had before and understanding that you never had before. You now have patience that you never had before. You now have a peace about things in your life that you never had before. What also begins to take place through this growth spiritually is you begin to have more confidence in who God is in your life. You begin to realize development that is taking place is supernatural and it's not you. Something has changed. You've been born of the Spirit. You've been born from above. And it says in verse 15 that whoever believes in him who was lifted up on the cross, whoever believes in him, verse 15, should not perish but have what? Everlasting life. Why does he have everlasting life? Because the spirit lives forever. The flesh dies. The flesh falls away. The spirit lives forever. And the way you have your spirit live forever is you have to be born of the spirit. Now, there was a time I did not understand that. I didn't know what that meant. Born again. I never knew that Jesus said that I must be born again. I didn't know that. But once I found out that I must be born again, I was at a place in my life where I was desperate to be born again. I was desperate to try to have this do-over in my life. And that's what God offers you. He offers you a do-over. You might not be happy with the way things are going with your first birth. Well, God says, I'll give you a new birth, a brand new birth, brand new. Maybe you're here today and you go, there's nothing wrong with my life. My life is wonderful. Everything's grandiose. I love my life. Everything's perfect. I got no problems. I don't need to be born of the Spirit. My flesh is working great for me. Well, being you came to this church and you listened to the sermon and the words of Jesus Christ, he might, be able, he might change things for you <laughs> and show you this life is broken and has nothing to offer. Nothing that's sustainable. Nothing that lasts. Everything moves on. 
Everything changes. God created the seasons to prove that. Everything changes. That whoever believes in him who is lifted up on the tree should not perish but have everlasting life. Verse 16. For God so loved the world. He loved the world. He loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him who is lifted up on that tree should not perish but have what? Everlasting life. Why? Because you're born of the Spirit. The Spirit never dies. You have everlasting life. You know what everlasting life means in the Greek? It means life that lasts forever. Life that lasts forever. You might think, well, that might get boring after a while. Life that lasts forever. Have you ever experienced something that was so good in your life that you didn't want it to end? Have you ever experienced this one thing in your life and you thought to yourself, oh, I don't want this to end? Well, that's heaven constantly, but on a, like a scale beyond what you can imagine. It's that experience that you wish would never end. Time billion. That's heaven constantly. And God loved you so much that he didn't want you to miss out on that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. His only begotten son, Jesus Christ, was offered up as a sacrifice so that you would not have to punish the condemnation and judgment of your sin. He offered up Jesus Christ to take that penalty. He offered his own son to come and take that penalty so that you would not have to. So that you could be born again, born of the Spirit, and enter into the kingdom of God for all of eternity to live in wow land. Wow land. I, I think the word wow will be the most popular word in heaven. Everybody will walk around. You won't say hi. You'll say wow. 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 That's going to be the word in heaven. Wow. And God loved you so much that he didn't want you to miss that. Not only you, but for God so loved the world. There isn't a human on earth that God wants to miss this. He wants you. He wants you. And how bad did he want you? He wanted you so bad that he was willing to let his son, Jesus Christ, go through what he went through. He loves you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him, whoever, would not perish but have everlasting life. Verse 17 says, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him, Jesus Christ, the world might be saved. Some people have a bizarre and weird thought about how who God is. First John says that God is love. God is love. Love isn't God. God is love. God is love. He's a loving God. The Bible, all through the whole Bible, it says that he's a merciful God, that his mercies are new every day. He's a merciful God. It says that he's a forgiving God. He says he's, he's a God of grace and that Jesus sits on the throne of grace. He's a God of comfort, peace. He's a good God and he's in love with you and he's in love with you so much he offered his son up on the cross to to go through a brutal death because he loved you. I have a son and I would gladly go through any misfortune for him so that he wouldn't have to. I'd give whatever organs he needed. I'd lay down my life for him. 
And I'm just an earthly father, and that's an earthly son. Can you imagine how much more a heavenly father, who is love, willing to lay down his life for you? Verse 18 says, He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten of the Son. He who believes is not condemned, but he who does not believe is already condemned. Why is he already condemned? Because he was born a sinner. Sin, if you sin, you're condemned. If you have your sins forgiven, you're not condemned. If you have your sins taken away, you're not condemned. If you have Jesus Christ, who is the only one adequate, qualified to lay down his life for you, You're not condemned. Why is he the only one qualified to lay down his life for you? Because Jesus Christ is a human. You're a human who sinned. The only one that could could be the sacrifice for your sin is to have a human without sin die for you or take your punishment. You can't have another human who already has sinned die for your sin because they deserve to be dead. So you have to find a human on this earth that has no sin. Well, that's impossible because every person on the entire planet has sin. Even a two-year-old baby has sin. They're the cutest sinners in the world, but they're sinners. When they say, no, give me mine, everyone's disqualified. So what's the remedy? The remedy is you need to have God who is perfect become the creation For one purpose, to lay down his life, be the sacrifice for your filthy life. And then completely cleanse you, completely forgive you, completely remove anything that's in the way for you to enter heaven, give you a spiritual birth, prepare you for eternity. That's the way it works. Because you're already condemned, but he who believes is not condemned. His sins, her sins, are completely forgiven and removed out of the way. You have spiritual birth, and you're prepared for heaven. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50 starts this way. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and bone cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, For the trumpet will sound and the dead will rise incorruptible. And we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption. And this mortal has put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written. Death is swallowed up in victory. Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thank be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. Guys, there's good news. There's really good news on this side of the cross. God wishes that none would perish. All would come to saving grace. All would come to repentance. What are you going to do with the word the words that you've heard today through God's message, through God's holy Bible, what will you do with these words? Will you neglect them, shun them, think of them as just 
another preacher. Just there's another preacher preaching about Jesus. I'm not just another preacher. I'm not. In the flesh, I may not be perfect, but in the spirit, God has made me perfect. But not only that, but God has called me to be a messenger of his word. He hasn't called me to come and give my own message. He hasn't brought me and called me so that I could deliver some beautiful poem or great stories. God has called me to just give the message that he has written to you. But what will you do with God's message? Not Pastor Keith's message. What will you do with God's message? How will you react to it? How will it stimulate you? How will it move you? Will it move you closer to the cross or move you further away? Will it encourage you as Nicodemus to seek out God? Like Nicodemus, that void, he knew that void was there. He knew that there had to be something else. Could you be like Nicodemus this morning, knowing that there has got to be something else? Has to be. There just has to be something else. God is that something else. He tells us in his own word. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing. Yet the inward man, the spiritual man, is being renewed day by day. How? By the word of God. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Our light affliction. What is the light affliction? In the scope of eternity, this life on earth is small. It's nothing. But this light affliction on earth, this, this difficult time on earth that we struggle through, the, this chaotic world, t- ninth, uh, year 2020, probably the weirdest year I've ever lived in, is fading. But it's helping us grow spiritually and, and search out the Lord. Verse 18, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are what? Temporary. But the things which are not seen are eternal. Chapter 5, verse 1 says, for we, for we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house, not made with hands. It's eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, eagerly desiring to be clothed our habitation That is from heaven. If indeed having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed. That mortality may be swallowed up by life. Each of you in this room are mortal beings. Mortality. You're all mortal beings. And he says, mortality is swallowed up by what? Life. Do you realize that God doesn't even count this as living yet? Life really begins when mortality is swallowed up by eternal life. And only comes through through being born again. And that only comes through believing in Jesus Christ who is hanging on a tree. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do? How long will you reject it or shun it or brush it off? How long will you just keep on going like you're going? There's going to be a day of reckoning where you're going to have to come to grips with how your choices have turned out. You're going to have to. You're going to have to live with your choices. And how long will you live with your choices? Forever. When your lungs stop breathing, your heart stops pumping and your life is no more it's too late for do-overs but today is time for a do-over the Bible says today is the day of salvation today, not tomorrow not next week, no I'll think about it this week and maybe next week God is offering you today 
the opportunity to trust in the Lord, be born of the Spirit, and live forevermore with him in paradise. He's offering that today. Today. You have that today. And you have no guarantees for tomorrow. You don't know if God will ever move your spirit like he's moving you this morning. You'll ne you never know that if God will ever bring you to the place where you are today, emotionally, spiritually. You're here. God brought you here. God spoke to you this morning. He really did. I'm just a messenger. I have shared nothing with you but the Bible. There's nothing else I shared with you this morning but God's word. Now you have a responsibility. How you respond to it. Will you receive it with gladness? Or will you count it as not nonsense? One day, the full reality of this truth will be revealed to you one way or the other. But today is the day of salvation. If you know for a fact that God has called your ears to hear his word today and you truly want to make a decision to accept the work of the cross into your life to let it comfort and remove the sin in your life to be born again this morning to truly be done with it knowing that today you finally made the final decision and it needs to no longer haunt you no longer needs to be a thought of a decision but today it could be settled the Bible says that if you confess Jesus before man, then he'll confess you before the Father. And if you deny the Lord before man, he'll deny you before the Father. That's why we don't bow our heads and close our eyes when I ask you if you made a decision. Because God wants you to make a public confession of your faith. He wants that. He wants to even know. There's no secret agents in God's army. None. We all know who we are because we've all made a decision openly. And so openly today, unashamedly, with all boldness, with all confidence, with all zeal, with all of your heart, do you want to receive the Lord Jesus Christ into your life this morning? Be born of the Spirit and all your sins removed. If that's you this morning, all you have to do is stick that hand in the air like you mean it and say, pick me. Amen. 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 Welcome to the family of God. You're stuck with me for eternity. Welcome. Now, I know for a fact there's a few more people that wanted to raise their hand and they didn't. I want to encourage you. Don't shrink back. Don't shrink back about the greatest decision of your entire life this morning. Be, be fast. Be alert. The devil will tell you don't Give your life to Jesus. Don't raise your hand in front of everybody. God is pleading with you this morning, pleading with you. Through me, he's pleading with you. Come to me. Come to me. I'm going to ask you again for those who have held back and wishing, wishing you didn't, but now you can. We'll do a do-over. Raise your hand if you'd like to receive Christ this morning into your heart. Amen. Amen. Father God, we thank you. Lord, we bless your holy name. You are the God who inspires. You're the God who teaches. The God who instructs. You're the God who comforts and directs us where we should go. And I pray for those who have made that decision this morning to receive you into their hearts, to be blessed with the blood that's, that has been poured out 
for their sin, that you'd cleanse them, Father, that you'd purify them, that they would know for certain, Lord, that they are caught, captured, and preserved for all of eternity through Christ Jesus our Lord. I pray, Father God, that you give them the comfort, the peace that they've been searching for, that you'll begin to develop and design and, and instruct their life in the way they should go, Lord, that they would not shrink back any days at all in their life, that they would run towards the cross every day. I pray that the Holy Spirit would empower them and equip them for all good, godly things, Lord. And if you've made that decision this morning, pray with me in your heart, with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I understand now what you've done for me. I understand and I accept the responsibility that I have been a sinner. I have gone my own way. I have been selfish. And I have waited too long. But today, Lord, I want to give my life to you. I want to surrender to you this morning, Lord. Lord, would you come into my life? Would you just come into my life? Would you quicken my spirit? Lord, would you please just be patient with me and and constant in my life. Lord, I thank you for, for forgiving me. I thank you for cleansing me of all my sin. And Lord, I ask that the Holy Spirit would come into my life and guide me and direct me in all that I say and do. That you give me the strength and the power to live this Christian life, Lord, because I know I could never live it on my own, in my own strength. So Lord, I come today, and I'm so blessed that I came today to hear your word, that your word, that would bring life into me. So Lord, be with me, direct me, guide me. And I thank you, Lord, and I'm so blessed. And Father, we just come to you also, all of us, that uh, you would just continue to strengthen us as we live our lives for you. Keep guiding us on the right path, Lord. Forgive us of our sins, and we give you all glory and honor. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen.